I have been looking forward to this podcast for a long time, gentlemen. This is new information. This is new science that's been mainly published in the professional journal since 2007. It's very intriguing new information, but we cannot any longer trust the established model of the origins of civilization since it does not take into account an extinction level event right in the foundations. And that's why I say the house of history appears to be built on foundations of sand. Now, this hasn't been adopted yet, but is it resisted? Is, uh, has the mainstream? Yes. It is. It's being resisted. Whenever you, whenever you propose a cataclysm of any kind, it's a curious thing. I don't know whether it's psychological or something more sinister than that. But whenever, whenever you propose that and present evidence for it, you can be sure that you will be descended upon by a furious crowd of critics. If we look here at the image, <clears throat> what I'm sure, now this is not from the catastrophic flood we're talking about here, <laughs> obviously. But interestingly enough, this was a hundred year flood that happened in Georgia back in 2004. And what we had was a, a floodplain that got uh, overtopped for the first time in decades. And it left these current ripples here. And I just, I, I use this slide to show what we're used to on the scale mm -hmm. that, of phenomena that we would normally see, right. this kind of phenomena. So this is a normal, very large major storm. Yes. That, you know, makes sense. This was Hurricane Ivan when it came through in 2004. It, mm -hmm. it was, they referred to it as a hundred year flood. Right. So, so this is a massive storm, but it's nothing out of the ordinary, really. It's right. just, it's rare. Like yeah, huge. it's rare. What you'll see here is, you know, I've got a measuring tape here. You're going to see the wavelength is about three inches. The amplitude, the vertical height of these things is about three quarters of an inch. And so these are all, what we're looking at is all dried dirt that yeah, has sand. Been, yeah, sand. It's been rippled. It's been carried along, in, swept along in this water that was over this floodplain, which was two feet deep. Mm -hmm. Carried along, and as the water declined, it, it, it deposited this sand and then rippled it as the final stages. And we're looking at this at what year? How long after the, the storm was this? this? This was a week or two after the storm, okay. because within a month, this was all, all obscured right. by wind and, and everything. So now, just so you've got this by comparison, we'll go to this. This is what Graham was just talking about, Camas Prairie. And, and what you see here is there's ranches out there, and you've got this 10-mile-long field of these gigantic ripples. And if you look up in the upper left-hand corner of the screen, you can see some of these ripples. They're, like Graham said, they're, they're 100 to 300 feet in wavelength, and they're up to 50 feet in amplitude. And the water that flowed through here that, that deposited this was over 1,000 feet deep. So this is fractal. This is fractal. You, fractal, get, it, exactly. you get it in the small scale in the, in the first image rattle show, the same phenomenon there with a flood just two feet deep. And then we come to this humongous testimony. It would, it would seem that this would be something that a, a lot of mainstream scientists and archaeologists would be extremely interested in. Like, why would they, why would they try to ignore something like The first this? thing they try to do is to get rid of it. This is often the case where new information emerges that contradicts established, established theories. And it's a strange phenomenon in science because we like to think of scientists as, as rational and, and, and reasonable people. But the fact is that when you get very committed to a particular model, to a particular idea, I think you start to connect your own personality to it. And any attack on that idea becomes an existential attack on, on you yourself. How sad. And it, is, and it is sad because again and again what we see is the, uh, the new facts being dismissed because they don't fit the existing theory. Where in fact what we should be doing is modifying the existing theory to explain the newly discovered facts. And this is a, this is a problem in the whole history of science. But today things have changed. And, and what I see is the, the archaeological mainstream in a state of denial about this information. They just don't want to recognize it and absorb it, but they're going to have to recognize it. It's going to be forced upon them, whether they like it or not. It's so sad because, you, you know, you count on these people to uh, distribute the information, but they, their egos get involved in things. And if you've been teaching something for a long time, then it turns out you gave out master's degrees on things that were completely incorrect. Absolutely. It's, Absolutely. It's got to be And, and something, something else, although this sounds a bit con 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 conspiratorial, I, I think the existing view of history is part of a mind control system in our society. It's, it's something that we're presented with, that we take in with our mother's milk, and we're never supposed to question. Um, I think it's if you control the past, you do mm -hmm. actually control the present and the future as well. So, but you mean if you have an absolutely established narrative that you're teaching and you're unwilling to look at any possible variations to that, you're, you're saying like almost from an authority position, we know yes. what happened and we know where we're going. Yeah, exactly. But if you say, shit, we don't know what happened, yeah. then yeah. it's, well, well, then who are you to tell us where we're going? Exactly. And okay. it starts to raise questions over everything. <clears throat> right. The, the scientists that have been in the opposition have been in the forefront of pushing this, this scenario of human caused mass extinction and blaming the extinction of the great megafauna that died out. 12,000 years ago on human hunters, which, I, again, we talked about that, and I consider that ludicrous, that, you know, paleo-Indian hunters using spears are going to cause the extermination of 10 million woolly mammoths before they could even reproduce, mm -hmm. along with 120 other species of megafauna. Well, 65% of all mammals in North America were wiped out wiped somewhere out. around that time, right? Mega mammals. Mega mammals. Yeah, which is over 100 ones. pounds in body weight, yeah. essentially. Yeah, yeah. And Actually, more, like 75%. 75%. 75%. 75%. It was almost instantaneous, though, right? Yeah. I mean, it was over a course of a very short period of time. Very, very short period out. of time. <clears throat> Ooh, that gives me goosebumps. A single afternoon, yeah. all over the world, everything changes forever. Absolutely, absolutely. And then I'd, I'd like, Randall, to address this issue of continent-wide wildfires, because we do see this in the, in, the, in the stratum, that when you get this superheated ejector coming down on, on ancient yeah. primal forests, consider the effect. This is Murray Springs, one of the Clovis sites, and this is what the, was known as the Black Mat Layer. Where's Murray Springs? It's in Arizona, and it's, it's southern Arizona, and it's near the Clovis site, which is um, New Mexico. Um, Clovis, the Clovis Impact Site? Well, no, the Clovis site was where the, one of the first places in North America where human remains were found in association with uh, extinct mega mammals, such as woolly mammoths. Um, and it's just outside of Clovis, New Mexico. And, and many of these Clovis sites, and there's been over 50 of them around now documented over North America, I think about two thirds of them have this black matte layer, which shows up very clearly in this image. Now that black matte layer is black because of the uh, considerable amount of carbon 
carbon soot that's in it. So in other words, right there, that's the evidence of your wildfires, is that this blanket of soot over the continent that left this black matte layer. And below that black matte layer, you'll find extinct mega mammals. Like here, you see the, the yellow arrow there points to the black matte layer. Now, if you look up, you'll see how it's more buff colored. Mm -hmm. That was the color of all of this, but the soot that was in that black matte layer has dispersed and, and colored the other uh, adjacent layers. But you'll notice the bones below are the bones of extinct mammals. The bones found above it are extant or still existing mammals. And that layer separates um, these, these, these two domains of extinct mammals and extant okay, mammals. Just a very clear line. Yeah, and, and you can see it. It shows up so clearly right. To here. people who are listening to this, when we're looking at the original image that Randall showed, it's almost like an Oreo cookie. Like there's mm -hmm. just a clean line mm -hmm. and then there's a white filling underneath. I mean, it is as clear as day. God, now at the perspective base. is so yeah. difficult in this. It, it's a difficult this is a, Because this, there's numbers that you guys are throwing around and, and there's concepts that you're throwing around that I, I just I have to pause when you're saying, well, wait a minute. I gotta try to fit this in somewhere. But yeah. it's, this is sitting 400 feet above the modern day Columbia. So we know that the water was at least this high. Well, actually it had to been higher than this. And how do we know that this rock just wasn't there? How do we know that it was carried by this? Uh... <clears throat> well, because it's not part of the bedrock. It's sitting on top of the land surface. Like all of these, if we, we look here, we've got some, some other- Do we know where it came from? Do we know how far away it, it, it or yeah, originated? Yeah, it, it's probably come from about 50 miles to 75 miles north of here. It's, it's the type of basalt it is, 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 has been identified. I don't remember specifically, but when you travel over this land, you see these giant boulders just strewn about. There's a place called Boulder Park. It's a tourist attraction now. You can wow. go see it. Yeah. yeah. And you can see there, I mean, Jesus. the size of that. And there's, let's see. Oh my God. Yeah. So they just stand out, like, out of nowhere. And this thing was transported almost 200 miles from, its, it's likely origin was Mount Robeson, and we didn't get to this one. Mm -hmm. But this is evidence that the, the, the flooding was much more extensive than just the Missoula right. flooding. Y North American I continental I divide. I should just jump in there and say that uh, it isn't any longer controversial that there was gigantic flooding in the Pacific Northwest, and in, indeed across the whole range just south of the ice cap. That, that is accepted now. But yeah. the very idea that there was flooding at all was hotly opposed for, for decades. There was a great American geologist called J. Harlan Bretz, mm -hmm. who was the first to document the fact that there had been colossal flooding in that area. And he lived in the 1900s and 1920s. And because he suggested that there had been a cataclysm, of course, he was exiled by his colleagues. Mm -hmm. Eventually, his data prevailed and he was awarded the Penrose Medal, the highest award of the geological uh, geology in America in 1976 when he was like 96 years old. That must have sucked and, for and him. And he said then, he said, he said, all my enemies are dead, so I have no one left to gloat over. <laughs> That's what he said. <laughs> yes. Oh my God. But it's so disturbing to me that it works like that. Yeah, it works that, like that. So, they're but demonized. What, but what happened, you see, was Harlan Bretz was convinced from the beginning that he was dealing, and this is a very experienced field geologist, that he was dealing with a single humongous flood. Randall, what is this crazy image? Well, this is actually out of a 19th century text when catastrophism, before catastrophism, had been completely exorcised from mainstream geology. And this was um, Louis Figure, I think was his name, who speculated that the, that the ice sheets over northwestern Europe had catastrophically melted down. And he had an illustration in his geology text which perfectly captures how these large erratics are actually being transported aboard these icebergs. And you can see the scale of the thing. And this is the kind of, you see a whole forests are about to be washed away here. We've got some, inter this was a place that Graham and I visited here, which really spectacularly mm -hmm embodies this whole phenomenon. This is known as, as Dry Falls Cataract. And it's about five miles wide. And I'm going to show you ground photographs and a couple of aerial photographs of it so you can kind of get the scale of the thing. Now, this and the was, great thing is anybody can go there. Yeah. This, is, this is on the land. It's, it's, it's ours to look at. We Even, can all go and see this. It's an yeah, amazing trip to see it. You could go there, Joe. They would let you in there to see this. Oh. Now, now, you'll notice these, that there's a series of these alcoves here that, that you know, these, these horseshoe shapes. back on the image of Dry Falls. But yeah, back on the image of Dry Falls, exactly. And, and at some point, somebody's going to be able to see these images, right? Yeah, well, people could go and Google them online, but they'll see okay. them right now on YouTube if they watch the YouTube version of the show. If they see the YouTube, okay. So here's a typical Horseshoe Falls of Niagara, which is, which is a modern uh, cataract, receding cataract. And this, this horseshoe shape is very typical of the way water will erode bedrock. Because water flows faster in the middle of the stream, therefore it erodes faster in the middle, and not so much as you get towards the margins. And so it creates this classic horseshoe shape profile. And that's what we're seeing here at Dry Falls. Now, this is just one of the alcoves of about half a dozen of the alcoves that we saw in the, the map of it. In other words, this is a monstrously big waterfall. Yes. Now, Dry today. Just <laughs> off to the left of the picture is, is where, um, actually, there's a photograph in Graham's book taken um, from, let's go back, we skipped over it. There yeah. it is. This is the viewpoint. And this is Horseshoe Falls of Niagara superimposed on Dry Falls, so you can get mm. a sense of the scale. So Niagara Falls is a tiny, tiny little thing yeah. by comparison with this ancient fossilized waterfall. <laughs> dry Falls between Upper and Lower Grand Coulee in Washington State is the result of flooding. What? Yeah. And, and for people, like, try to explain this for people that are listening, because it's it's probably 10 times bigger. Plus. Well, more than that. How many, it, how many times bigger? It's two and a half times as high. And well, figure this. The, the discharge over of the Niagara River over the falls is a couple hundred thousand cubic feet per second maximum. The, the discharge over Grand Coulee was somewhere between 300 and 400 million cubic feet per second, or in other words, somewhere between 10 and 20 times the combined flow of every river on Earth flowing all at once. And <laughs> the height of this stark face here, this cliff, is about 400 feet. Oh the God. water coming over was about 400 feet deep. So 
if you were here visualize, see, witnessing this at the peak of the flood, you wouldn't in fact even see a waterfall. What you would see is this massive 10 mile wide turgid river choked with icebergs and debris and whole forests. And that, that river is rapidly flowing at what, 60, 70 miles Six, an hour? 60, 70 miles an hour. What you would have seen here was just a bump in this flood. And then only at the latter stages of it would it actually have been a waterfall. As the, as the water source was dissipating and as the water was declining, you would have the final stage of it being a waterfall, then eventually the waterfall stopped, and what you have today is this fossilized feature of this massive, and this is only one of about a half a dozen. See, here's the problem. Geologists haven't been focused on catastrophism. What they've been doing, they work for the government, they work for the oil companies, they, they're more interested in what's down below, the, the, the natural gas, the oil and so stuff. The money is. There's, another yeah. point, there's another point I'd like to add to that, Randall, as to yeah. why geologists are not uh, focused on catastrophes. Uh, geology uh, is a science, uh, and, and science, in effect, defined itself as being different from religious superstition. So the notion of the great flood that we find in the Bible became a very discredited notion in science. And, and uh, the, 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 by, by, by association with that, any suggestion of a great cataclysm in the past was seen as superstitious behavior yeah. to be shunned completely by the squeaky clean right. shiny new sciences who must never take that into account so any geologist who dares to propose a cataclysmic episode is up against that right away oh. that his colleagues don't want to go there because they're afraid that they're going to be accused of buying into Noah's flood or whatever that's so unfortunate but it's true and, and this is the this is the problem so there's there's c catastrophism and uniformitarianism and the prevailing dogma in geology is the uniformitarian dogma which is basically to say the way we see things in the world today that's how it's always been mm -hmm. it's never exactly. been any change so Randall what is the mainstream understanding of those 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 formations like what when they look at those the Utah ones for example gigantic Utah I have searched and searched and I find nothing they just don't explain it they don't explain they just it go oh look how pretty this this picture is interesting because what it does is it it, it shows that you know you travel over these this landscape explain it, what this picture is and where is okay, it okay you know now this is um this is in uh Western Montana, and this is a place called um, Dry Creek. And what this is is just a gravel pit. But what you see here is deposits caused by surging floodwaters moving up tributary valleys, loaded with sediment. And one of the things that a stratigrapher or a sedimentologist looks at is you notice how they're tilted. You see how the, the, the layers are tilted? Mm -hmm. Okay, that's an indication of which direction the water is moving. The tilting goes down in the direction that the water is flowing. So what we see here is massive turbulent sediment-laden floodwaters back flooding up a valley, surging, leaving deposits, and then flowing back out, followed by another wave, followed by another wave. People traveling over this landscape don't see what's under their feet. Well, it all makes sense. It really does. It's, it's all shocking and stunning and fantastic, but it all makes sense. I, I think it does make sense. And, and, and I think it's, it's, it's something that's part of the human heritage. It's something that we, we all have to get to grips with. Again, this is one of the things I find in, encouraging about developments in the world today is that more and more people do appear to be thinking for themselves. You know, there, there was a, a time when we, we took the word of specialists. Dr. X or Professor Y said this, mm -hmm. it had to be true. That was the first argument, was the argument from authority. The authorities say this cannot be so, therefore it is not so. And a lot of people just, just bought that. What's changed, I think, in the last 20 years is that that, that, that um, subservience to authority has gone away. It hasn't gone away completely, but we don't trust authority anymore, rightly and properly, because we've been lied to by authority figures, and we know they lied to us, and we saw the evidence. So this must have been just an absolutely enormous event when it happened, and, and really Unimaginable. sudden. Unimaginable. Unimaginable. And human beings lived through that, and it changed everything. These they're called extinction level events. These global cataclysms wipe the slate clean. And then they began to evolve and, and here we are. So dinosaurs became chickens and shrews became human That's beings. That's almost the world harder changes. for me to imagine than this. This is very hard to be, for me to wrap my head around, but that we came from a shrew 65 million years well, ago is almost the, harder. That's the, that's, that's, that's the story of, <laughs> yes. of, of evolution. One can buy into it or not. One can buy into it or not.